I am so happy that you tuned into this episode because it's not every day that I get to talk about a conservation success story. There have been many conservation success stories over the period of marine conservation. However, it's not often that we get these wins. And today we're going to be talking about the Pacific bluefin tuna because there's been a huge international coordinated effort to bring the species back from the brink of extinction to something that could actually be seen as a population that is growing. And we've actually hit that day. There's been a recent stock assessment that shows that there's been a huge increase in the number of female Pacific bluefin tuna that can have reproductive, that can have reproductive success. And it shows that we could actually turn you know, a lot of bluefin tuna or a lot of tuna species around uh, from bad management in the past very quickly. In fact, 10 years earlier than we expected for this Pacific bluefin tuna. So we're going to talk about this conservation success story, what happened, why it became such a story, and what happened really to understand that, hey, this species was in trouble. We're going to talk about that on today's episode of the How to Protect the Ocean podcast. Let's start the show. Hey everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the How to Protect the Ocean podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Lewin, and this is the podcast where you find out what's happening with the ocean, how you could speak up for the ocean, what you can do to live for a better ocean by taking action. And today we're going to be talking about that action taking uh, by government and by a number of government, international governments. Now, when we talk about the Pacific tuna, the bluefin tuna, we talk about a species that goes across borders. This is not a species that just understands that there are U.S., Canadian, and international borders. They stay within those national boundaries so that they can get better protected. No, 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 no. This is a species that goes, it starts off in the Sea of Japan, all the way in between Japan and the Philippines, where they're, where they're bred and they're born, and then they come over to, like, the Baja California, Mexico area, and then they go back after a year and where they feed and stuff and go back for a 6,000 6, mile trek across the Pacific and they do it in like 55 days because they're incredible swimmers. And and it's, it's great to see like a species like this that is highly sought after for food rebound the way it has. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. It's going to be the focus because I came across this article on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. So if you ever want to hit me up on LinkedIn, please do so. I came across this this article. Uh, it's a LinkedIn article by Jamie Gibbon, who is a, a manager of international fisheries at the Pew Charitable Trust. And it caught my eye um, because he talks about the, the Pacific bluefin tuna, a decade-long conservation success. And he links to another NOAA article that talks about, you know, how it's went from overfish to a sustainable success story. But Jamie's talk he starts off his article really in an interesting way. He talks about like how working in conservation can sometimes feel like an endless slog filled with both victories and frustrating setbacks and focusing on international fisheries which have been doing for over which he's been doing for over a decade can make everything feel like it's more drawn out. High, high seas fisheries are very valuable, worth tens of billions of dollars a year. And so there's a constant pressure to increase the amount of fish that can be caught, but management decisions are usually only made once a year. So if the progress isn't met after that one year, you have to wait an entire 12 month cycle to get your management priorities in place for the next year. And if it's not in there, it's not, it's not great. So that can help build overfish stocks. Tuna and sharks grow relatively slowly um, So you know, and, and live a relatively long time. So recovery can feel like it takes forever. But that's why this, this is interesting because back in, in 2012, as Jamie reports, um, a scientific report showed that the population of Pacific bluefin tuna had been decimated over, by overfishing, which the stock dropped over 96% from its historic high. But that didn't stop a Japanese sushi chain from buying the bluefin tuna caught the next year for $1.7 million in a celebratory auction. You, know, you got to remember that these, the species is large. Uh, when, you buy, when you get one particular species, they could weigh up to 1,000 pounds. And, and they can, they're huge. They're like 10 feet in length. So they are big species. They are big fish. So buying something for $1.7 million is a huge, huge win. Um, so with that decision, though, everything was going wrong for the species, showing that the money was outweighing the need for conservation. And in fact, you know, with a lot of tuna species, the 
you know, sort of the the imminent decision or the imminent imminent um, likelihood of you know these species going extinct that could go extinct kind of increase their value of each individual species that's caught or each individual of that species that's caught. You know, so a lot of places, a lot of corporations would catch these uh, tuna, freeze them for a long time, for like 20 years or so, and sell them down the line when they know that they're going to be extinct for more money. It's just an investment for a lot of these corporations. If you don't know what I'm talking about, watch End of the Line. Uh, It is uh, an impeccable documentary that is narrated by Ted Danson, who's involved with Oceana, and they talk about the tuna industry in general, and you get a feel for what this um, what the tuna industry goes through in Europe, in the Mediterranean, uh, in the Pacific, in the Atlantic, and it's 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 quite interesting. Uh, and you really have to know your stuff when you start looking into this and when you start buying, you know, just tuna just for yourself individually. But these are like government things. Like these are government priorities and, and not just the U.S., not just Canada, but we're looking at international uh, sort of uh, sort of like an, an inter- international effort is what the word I was looking for, is a huge international effort. And that's what we got. Um, but going on to sort of, you know, the, the area where we saw a 96% decline from its its historic high, the Pew Charitable Trust decided it was time for the, for the to focus on this Pacific blue fin and start a campaign to get countries to agree on catch limits. So at this point, there wasn't really, there was probably a huge catch limit, but it wasn't, you know, very good for like people could, or countries could, Catch and fishers can catch juvenile fish as well as adult. So it's, it's essentially anything you can get. Usually when you fish and there's set sizes or quotas, you have to fish a specific size. So if they're underneath a specific size, you can't fish them. If they're over a specific size, it's fine. If you start fishing all the juveniles, you can never have these fish that grow up. You never have the females that grow up and are able to reproduce. One thing about bluefin tuna, Pacific bluefin tuna, is they can lay you know, hundreds of eggs, thousands of eggs at a time, even millions of eggs at a time. And so you can you, you can get a, a, a strong rebound in the next generation if you let those fish get to adulthood and get to a repro- get to, to reproduce. So that's where that's the level that they were trying to build to, but it wasn't going to be easy because fisheries was managed by two separate committees which didn't have a process to cooperate or agree in complementary measures. So they're very separate, very siloed. And he says at the first, uh, this is Jamie saying, at our first scientific meeting, our small group of observers, including staff from Marine uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium and Seafood Watch, weren't even able to comment on the proceedings as they were limited to asking one question at the end of each day. That's not a, a great way to incorporate, uh, you know, individuals and, and, and organizations that are looking out for the environment. They're looking out for the spit, for the fish. A lot of times these NGOs have to come in because the, the fish need a voice, right? The, the conservation, the things that are being conserved need a voice. It's not just about money. It's not just about fishing. Now, over the next five years, uh, Jamie says he traveled to Japan over 15 times, building informal co- building an informal coalition of NGOs, giving interviews to the Japanese press, and then advocating directly to government officials. He said uh, Pew Charitable Trust developed supportive uh, government allies who joined their calls for a joint meeting a committee meeting where more with more transparency in the scientific process, a plan to rebuild the species and a plan to rebuild the species. So they supported new research, wrote interventions, redline proposals, and even pushed a lot a listing under the Endangered Species Act. They were all small victories, but also a bunch of setbacks. So there were a lot of things that were going on, right? And in seventeen in twenty seventeen, countries on both sides of the Pacific. So on the, on the west side of the Pacific and on the east side of the Pacific, finally agreed to an ambitious rebuilding plan that would bring the species back to sustainable levels within a decade. They said to 2034, but actually brought it back within to 2024, 2022, when they did the last stock assessment. Fish quotas were cut, fewer uh, small fish were caught, and the stock was allowed to reproduce and recover. Now, I'm going to go over and shift over. That was just sort of like a, a, a summary of what Jamie went through and sort of like an individual perspective from an American NGO that was really involved in the process. Now, when I look at the uh, NOAA uh, uh, article, which I'll link both of these articles in the, uh, in, the, in the show notes, if you have a LinkedIn, I, don't, I think if you have to, you might have to have an account in, on LinkedIn to be able to view the LinkedIn article. Um, but essentially, it's a, it's a great, it's a great, well-written sort of summary of what 
you know, Jamie went through as a manager and seeing this, the success of this within, you know, seven years, less than 10 years, which is, which is great. Um, so, you know, essentially this article kind of goes through a lot of, a lot of things. So, you know, talks about how tuna are about 10 feet in length, they average about 990 pounds, so almost a thousand pounds. Um, the habitat is of this migratory species spans temperate waters of the North Pacific from East Asia to the North American West coast. They're almost, they are considered one of the fastest swimming species on the planet and live on an average about 15 years. So, you know, long live species for fish species. Um, the, in 2022, the U S commercial, uh, harvest uh, fishers harvested 368 metric tons, which is less than what they normally do of bluefin tuna grossing more than $2.2 million in on the dock revenue. I don't know exactly what that means, but obviously that's specific. Uh, and then the U S uh, the whole U S effort, both uh, that year, sorry, both recreational and commercial represent around 10% of the total blue, uh, blue Pacific bluefin tuna landings for that year in 2022 and Japanese and Mexican vessels harvest the majority of the annual uh, catch. So obviously different countries that need to be involved in this, including Japan and Mexico, as well as the U S. Um, and so that was, you know, that's, that's a, a really interesting area. Now the international cooperation that led to the species success was the, the biggest thing. And the article goes into the hardships that it faced. Um, you know, the fact that, uh, the goal of the rebuild was to rebuild at least to 20% of the spawning stock biomass by 2034. So that means 20% of the, 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 the population would be able to spawn. So it'd be, it'd be female, they'd be able to spawn and that would provide them with a better success rate in going to the next generation and the next generation after that. So the manage, management efforts uh, to rebuild the stock, the stock assessment started in 2011, as I mentioned earlier. And now in 2022, there was a new stock assessment that showed that we actually reached uh, the number of spawning bluefin reached 23.2%. So it exceeded the 20% target uh, before, but it, they did it in 2022, not 2034. So over 10 years early in that prediction and in that goal. Can we double it again within the 10, next 10 years? That'll be interesting to see. That's interesting to see how this population will be managed, how the difference is in not only just managing the catch limits and everything, and as the species grows, the population grows, you'll see a change in the way they manage the species, but there will be direct influence on catch limits and, and things like that. But then we also have to account for changes in, you know, the water itself, the habitats and how climate change is really going to affect the species and what risk that plays in their recovery. We've seen that happen before with cod you know, in, in, in Canada, and we've seen that, you know, the, the recovery hasn't been the greatest, whether it's been blamed on gray seals, or it's been blamed on harp seals, or it's been blamed on climate change, but we haven't really seen that buildup of success in the recovery of the species just, just yet. It's starting to happen in certain spots, but not happening around Atlantic Canada, or even Atlantic, the, in, in the Northeast uh, Atlantic of the US. And so that that species has, hasn't really covered, that population hasn't recovered to the levels that we would like to see um, that has, that we were fishing back in the 70s and 80s at least. Um, but it, you know, every fish is unique and it's different. And so we're lucky that with the Pacific bluefin tuna, we've seen this growth and we've seen this conservation success story happen, but there's still a long way to go. Just having 23% of the re of the spawning species around, that's great, but we want more. It'd be great. It'd be great if we could even double that. And it would be great to see if that can be increased further down the line. So there's still management that needs to be done. There's still things that need to be done. And, and so the committees that are in charge of the eastern and western portions of the tuna fishing, um, you know, the, it's basically a northern committee working group on bluefin management, is set to meet in Japan in July to recommend conservation and management measures for 2025 and beyond. So there's new, re new reports that are going to be proposed and, and new um, protections are going to be deposed. And so they must adopt the recommendations at their annual meetings later this year. So the next step in the international management of bluefin is the development of a long-term harvest strategy starting next year. So starting in 2025. So the F South West Fishery Science Center researchers for NOAA will help lead the management uh, strategy evaluation. It will incorporate engagement 
of the fish, from the fishing industry, managers, scientists, environmental groups to inform the new harvest strategy. So they're getting a lot of different stakeholders in, into play to ensure that they get a full breadth of what is needed, a full breadth of what is what is wanted, and then compromise in the middle. So, uh, you know, one of the people here, Ryan Wolf, assistant regional administrator for NOAA, uh, Fisheries West Coast Region and alternate U.S. Commissioner of one of the committees. It says the recovery of Pacific blue uh, Pacific bluefin tuna shows that we can achieve when scientists manage what we can achieve when scientists, managers, and the fishing industry work together in the international arena in pursuit of a common objective. And he goes on to say we'll continue this effort to ensure the sustainable harvest of bluefin tuna. Uh, for decades to come. So these management strategies for this important species is going to be critical in how we set management strategies for other to, uh, uh, any, any other type of tuna species that needs to be managed worldwide too. And it really goes to show that if we cooperate, then we can accomplish something great. If we cooperate internationally, then we can get something moving. We can actually see a species recover. And it also, it will depend on the species. There are certain species that are not that are slow growing. They're, they don't reproduce as quickly or as plentiful as or abundant as you know the, this Pacific bluefin tuna. There are other species out there that are very difficult to recover from any type of loss. So the prevention of that loss through marine protected areas and better fisheries management is really important. I know an organization like Oceana in Canada, they put it, and I think in the U.S. and other places where they are in different countries, they put out a stock assessment, uh, like annual report to show where the country is and the government of that country is in terms of managing their stocks. A lot of the times, I know in Canada, they're sort of deficient in a lot of data for their fish species stock assessments, and so they need to increase that. There needs to be resources that need to be added to that. There need to be people. There need to be money as those resources. There needs to be more effort and priority put on managing those stock assessments, managing the, the information that put that's put into those stock assessments and more priority on that. And that will help the fishing community. That will help the country as a whole. That will help the environment. And it'll put us, you know, for Canada, the U.S., any other country, at a leadership role when it comes to managing these fisheries harvests. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. I thought this is a great conservation story. There's still progress to be made. There still needs to be work that needs to be done. Uh, obviously, having this international coalition to manage this Pacific bluefin tuna species is huge, uh, and it, and that's essentially the precipice of the success that, that we see today and 10 years earlier than expected. So I love the fact that we got to see this. I think this is something that we need to duplicate with other tuna species around the world, and uh, I would love to hear your thoughts. So you can comment on this video uh, on YouTube, on Spotify, and if you can't comment there and you're listening to on other podcast uh, platforms, you can also hit me up on Instagram at How to Protect the Ocean. I'd love to hear what you think about this article and how the management of this tuna species is going and how you think we should manage other tuna species. Because I don't know a lot about tuna management. I'm trying to get, I'm working with an organization to get more stuff on tuna management and to see where other stocks are and where we need to go to get there. But this is going to be a lot of fun to be able to dive into tuna species and their recovery and management of that of that fishery, of, of those fisheries. So it's going to be a lot of fun. If you want to get more information on uh, ocean science and, and marine conservation, you can do so by signing up to my newsletter. It's uh, if you go to speakupforblue.com forward slash newsletter, that's speakupforblue.com forward slash newsletter. You can get access, just sign up. It's free to sign up. I don't do anything with your email. I don't sell it or anything. I keep it private. You get emails Monday to Friday to get access to that Ocean News, especially with jobs. Uh, and you get access to the latest podcast that we, uh, that we publish on our network. So it's a lot of fun. Check it out, speakupforblue.com forward slash newsletter. And I want to thank you so much for joining me on today's episode of the How to Protect the Ocean podcast. Have a great day. We'll talk to you next time and happy conservation.